couple for 36 years of ministry. And I only had one person that I remember, Brenda, who did not get filled with the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues because they, they were wanting to hold on, if I'm not mistaken, some level of witchcraft. And so here's the thing, you have to learn how to yield to it. Okay, I always tell people, you know, you don't talk with your mouth closed, right? You don't speak in tongues with your mouth closed. There's people, you say to them now, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So because we live in America, I never have to do that when I go overseas. I just say, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And hundreds and thousands of people just begin to, oh, no, 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 no. It, it, it's beautiful. In America, you got to kind of explain it. The first thing you got to do is you got to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You have to ask Jesus in your heart. And I know you're watching. You say, but I've done that. All right. Next thing you need to do is ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. Well, I've done that. Nothing's happened. Listen, it's not that hard. The Holy Spirit gives you the utterance. So if you're saved and you ask the Holy Spirit to fill you, then what you need to do is just start going. Move your mouth and your tongue. And you will feel utterance. He gives you utterance. Well, what? What am I saying? The Holy Spirit determines that. Your job is to lift it up. Now, how many of you, if I, if I do this to you right now, are you convinced in anything that I'm saying to you? Neither will you be convinced unless you hear yourself do it. So give voice to it. When the utterance comes, Oh, Wow, I heard that. It's not hard. Open your mouth. Be filled with the Spirit. Make sure you speak it out where you can hear it. All right, so we need bold people today. I think the days of bow your head and close your eyes, and if you want to give your life to the one who is beaten and bloodied and bruised and whipped, and crucified upon an old rugged cross if you would like to give your life to that individual named Jesus Christ just slip up a finger we don't want to embarrass you are you kidding me the sacrifice that was public he lay listen they laid him on a cross naked and we can't be bold and unashamed to say I want Jesus I'll raise my hand. I don't need to bow my head. I don't need to close my eyes. But then can I tell you something? Don't treat the Holy Spirit the same way. Do you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? I think so. No, don't be ashamed. Because the Holy Spirit is, when you get filled with the Holy Spirit and you go, you are, you are testifying and agreeing to something that is so holy. You know what it is? The blood of Jesus well how is that because in the Old Testament before Jesus sacrifice as the Lamb of God when you would sacrifice the lamb or you would sacrifice a bullock unto God and he would approve of that blood of that bullock or lamb how did you know he would send fire what happened after the lamb Jesus Christ shed his blood God said, all right, I'm going to show hell and I'm going to show generations to come that I approve of the last and final sacrifice of the Lamb's blood. And just like I showed all the previous examples, it's going to be forever settled. I'm going to bring the ultimate fire, the Holy Spirit. That's why you don't have to be ashamed. So, you know, people that tell you to reject tongues or it's of the devil, you are messing with the Holy Blood. That blood is worthy, and I'm going to add my agreement. How do you add your agreement to something? You say it, right? Tongues is an agreement with God's sacrifice. Because when you speak in tongues, well, you need an interpretation. Not when you're speaking to tongues to God. The Bible says you magnify Him. You're adding your witness. You're saying, thank you, God for Jesus but now if God has a message that he wants to speak to a congregation or an individual in tongues and interpretation if I call you out and begin to speak in tongues then guess what God has a message there should be an interpretation because then it's equivalent to prophecy that's what the Bible says so I want you to be bold you're here today you're not filled with the Holy Spirit 
or you've struggled with it, I want you, I'm not even going to tell you to raise your hand. I'm going to ask you to get your feet moving and come right up here in the front and let's go. All right, let's go. Let's go. Come on, let's go. I would like for Pastor Doug and Eileen and the altar team, I would like for the Sewinskis, if they would come on up. You guys are trained. I was just with Joan Hunter. Amen. They've been through her ministry. Thank God. She's powerful. I love her. They're very qualified trained. Come on up. Pastor Doug, as members, we need to make sure that they, God has handed that out. So maybe some about Thanksgiving or something. It'll be fun, and we'll have a great time Wednesday night. Also, Tuesday night, I'll be on with uh, the four of us, Pastor Gene Bailey, Mario Murillo, Lance Waddell, and then us, our ministry will be there. And then they asked if I would do a special Thanksgiving, and I, and I said, sure. So Michelle Bachman uh, will be there, as well as Dutch Sheets, and we'll do a special Thanksgiving. And so that'll be really, really cool. So we'll have a good time. It's going to be a great week. And then on Friday, I'm going to eat my leftover turkey legs. That's what I'm going to do and watch football. And Brenda's going to rub my feet. And she's going to, yeah. I keep saying that. It's not happened ever since I've been saying. Brenda, if we could decree and watch it happen debt-free and all this, I just keep, de- no. We, I got a massage chair when I was 50 years of age. That was like five years ago. And, and it's one of those that will do your feet and legs. So that's why she doesn't. She said, no, I'm on my own. That's what she said. So. But, uh, hey, I wanted to mention something because some people have been asking. I've just been waiting for the right time because they just needed some time to transition. And I thought, well, if I just go public with it. And uh, they called me uh, the other day. We're, we're good buds. But uh, some of you might have been wondering, and those of you that are watching, where Sunil is at. He is a great friend of our family, and we love him. And uh, he actually came to me uh, a while ago, and he said, Pastor Hank, he said, I know that uh, for years, you know, He's been here three years, and uh, we just took every day, every year, just to determine, you know, what's God going to do with Sunil? And, uh, you know, back in the days when he drummed for Kim Clement, he had been away from his family for many, many years. I think he said like 20-some years. And he and his wife and and, um, family just felt like, you know what, that they needed to, you know, uh, be closer to their family now, that that's what God was calling them to do. And he met with me, and I said, you know, Sunil, I'm in agreement with you, and uh, I thank God for the years that we could share together. And the good thing is he's still going to be connected. He'll be up here playing drums for us uh, and doing different things, and uh, he has a tremendous gift that you will probably continue to see being used. But I just wanted him to transition without people asking a bunch of questions and stuff. How many know you just sometimes need, because you know, you got to sell your house, you got to relocate and all that. And so we want God's continual blessing upon you, Sunil. So that's where he's at. And please, um, some of you, you know, when you write online, where's Sunil? Is he okay? He is, he's doing great. And really, you can go to his social media page. I'm not even sure if he has one, and he can tell you how great he's doing. But everything is okay, and, uh, you know, people wonder. But uh, we love him. Don't you appreciate what God did? So we're, we're blessed by that. All right, let's go to our Bibles to Mark chapter 10. And I want to talk today about uh, something that I feel like is extremely important, important. And it was really amazing to me, and I want to say this, because have you ever thought for a moment about Jesus? And those of you that are watching, I want you to hear me very carefully. Why did Jesus have to say in the New Testament over 15 times, he said the same thing. Are you ready for what it is? Those who have ears to hear. Now, everybody was talking to had ears. But why was he saying that? Because he was saying it, not because he was ignorant in the fact that the people he was talking to had ears. The problem is people tend to hear this way. And he was trying to get them to hear in their heart or their spirit. So 15 times he said, let those who have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit of God is saying. Because sometimes we hear things on the news, we hear things around uh, the streets of Jerusalem or whatever city you live in or nation, and we oftentimes think that that's the truth or that's the true perspective. Yet God has a perspective that He wants to share. And many times it's, it's opposite of the culture or things that are happening. That's how many times you, when, when things are going on in the world, you find what God's perspective or what His will is. A lot of times it doesn't go with the flow. That's why I sent prophets many times, and they would get, you know, they would get, you know, killed, stoned. Uh, they threw rocks at them because they would bring a contrary word to what was happening in the culture and what uh, the devil was wanting people to believe. And so have you ever thought about this also with Jesus? He was not always nice. Now, you say, he wasn't? <laughs> nice is, when, when people say, well, we as Christians need to be nice, you're not to be rude and obnoxious. 
But nice, if a person is nice in their viewpoints regarding the Bible, or nice with what's going on in the culture, or nice if you approach things that way with a political perspective, niceness is always connected to ultimately you won't do anything because you're nice. You don't want to offend anybody. You don't want to hurt anybody. And niceness is not listed in the fruit of the Spirit. (laughs) Kindness is. But you can speak the word of truth in love and in kindness without being prideful, arrogant, rude, obnoxious. And Jesus, in his kindness, was very bold. He would literally stand up and say to the religious community, which would be the evangelical church today, he wasn't so much that way when he would minister to the sinner, except he was very direct. Oh, but the woman who was caught in the midst of adultery. Don't you remember, Pastor? He was so beautiful with her. He, he, he wrote in the sand, and he, and he said, who, where are your condemners? Yeah, but he also looked at her in the eyes and said, don't you dare sin no more. He also, when he would cast out a demon, say, all right, you're delivered. Now, don't keep doing this. Okay, that's not nice. That's called being direct and confrontive. Now, when Jesus would, we see that today. And Jesus confronted it. He didn't stay, stay quiet. Now, I'm going to teach you something before I get into my message. Because we all want to be like Jesus. Now, here's the thing we have to also understand. Why would Jesus, if everything he said was received, he was very bold, or they would have never confronted him. If he was a conformist, doing whatever the culture said, whatever the political figures said, they would have never found reason to lie about him like they do today. They would have never found reason to threaten him like they do today. They crucified him because they didn't like what was coming out of his mouth. Yes or no? This is Jesus. I'm trying to wake up the church today. Because we become passive and nice. Keep your kindness, keep your love, but speak the truth. But here's the thing. Have you ever wondered why did Jesus say out of his mouth, Blessed are those who will not be offended in me. Well, Jesus, you're so nice. You healed the sick. You tell a woman caught in the midst of adultery, where's your condemner? Sin no more. Why would he say, blessed are those that are not offended in me? Because he offended people. Are you here? This is the Jesus of your Bible. The problem is we aren't reading our Bibles anymore. We don't even bring them to church anymore. And yet there's people in other countries that would love to have just one Bible. They barely have a page. And we need to start bringing our Bibles to church. Make a statement to yourself. Make a statement to a government right now that's in charge that want to take your religious liberties away. And if they had the opportunity to, they'd probably take your Bibles away. And they've already tried to shut down your churches. What's their agenda next? So you have to understand, Jesus said, blessed are those that are not offended in me. Well, why? Because he offended. Now, let's let's break out something else. Jesus mentioned something very powerful that I want to draw attention to a Bible, Bible figure if you're still struggling, if Jesus was nice. Again, nice is with compliance. Nice is with also a lack of boldness. You're, you're not going to say anything because you just want to be nice. Jesus, think about this. He said there was no greater prophet in the Bible than John the Baptist. Yet John did not come with any miracles. So he was not a miracle ministry. John the Baptist, would you say John the Baptist would be labeled as the nice prophet? No. He was a confronter. Right? Yes or no? And so there was an anointing upon John the Baptist. And who did they think that John the Baptist was risen from the dead? Who did they think he was? They thought he was Elijah. Now, how many of you know 1 Kings 18? Elijah was a very bold, confrontive prophet to the point where, where there was such a confrontation that it stirred up political government. People say, well, churches should not be involved in politics. But yet you read in your Bible that God would send prophets and people to speak to governmental leaders. Even Jesus told the people, you go tell Herod, who was a political figure, he didn't say Herod, he goes, you tell Herod that fox. Now, there are some theologians that have been arguing back and forth that that word fox, you can't translate it like sly, cunning. It doesn't mean that. 
Many theologians believe that Jesus was saying, go tell that governmental official, let's talk politics for a moment, go tell that bisexual uh, uh, leader such and such. That's really what he was saying. He was not afraid to confront. So when it came to John the Baptist, John the Baptist, they said, oh, he's Elijah. Elijah was also the one who brought, put up 1 Kings 18, 21. Watch this. Elijah literally said, he went before all the people. So now he had an audience. And he was a confronter. Look at what he said. How long will you waver and be caught between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, you know what Baal worship is? It's what our culture is doing. Abortion. But it's also this. Baal worship under the command of a Jezebel ruler or spirit, you could read it in your Bible, was a mixture of Judaism with all of the false gods. That's why when you hear things, oh, it's just one God. Be careful. God doesn't like that kind of stuff. You know, it's, everybody has the same God. It's just a different way. I had, I had somebody tell me that one time. They say, well, you know, the Hindus and the Buddhists and all this, you know, it's kind of like if you would bring an elephant in a room and everybody was blind and they would touch the tail. And they'd say, well, what does this elephant look like? Well, it looks like this. Well, and then they'd grab the trunk. Well, it looks like this. Same way with God. Different viewpoints, different religions, same elephant, same God. And I stopped the person. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. You said everybody in the room was blind, right? She said, yes. I said, well, I once was blind, but now I see. I know the true God. And he ain't the God of the Hindus and Buddhists. It's not the same God. Muslims. They were false prophets. Well, what is that likened to today? Majority of the media. They were confronters. Elijah was a preacher. He was bold. And yet the people remained silent. And if, if preachers are going to be bold... And people are going to be bold. we got to get behind them and not just be quiet and let them do all the job. Hey, you go out there. You take, you take the hits. I got you covered. Sure, you're, you're hiding down in your basement. But here's the thing. Elijah was a confronter. Now look at Malachi chapter 4. I'm just going off verse 6. The Spirit of God through the prophet Malachi says, Now wait a minute. There's some kind of an anointing that is going to come in the last days. So you've got to figure out, okay, now what kind of anointing is going to come in the last days? Notice it says in Malachi chapter 4, verse 6, God prophesies and says there is going to come a release of this anointing of confrontation, boldness, speaking out against the false, speaking out against the culture, speaking out against the wrong, right? We love revival in America, where we could just have God in our church, but we don't understand that the reason things are taking as long as they are, really they're not taking long to God, is because we're not just in revival, we're in reformation. And reform, sometimes it's not, by, it's not the multitudes that initially follow it. Let me give you an example. Uh, Martin Luther, he, he, was, he stood alone when he nailed the thesis upon the, the walls. They hated him. They wanted to kill him. Now look at how many Lutherans are part of that reformation. And so they're not always popular when they first come off. But Reformation will deal with so many things in society. It affects the government, the politi po political, the social, the culture. And so what happens is people, you know, they walk out of my services sometimes. And they don't realize that what you're hearing is you're not just hearing a nice little guy. But you're hearing one who has an anointing upon his life. I'm not the only one to bring change. That's what reform means. And sometimes it's not going to be popular. Or you're going to look at scriptures different. Because that's what Martin Luther did. He rose up and said, wait, whoa, 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 wait a minute. The just shall live by faith. There's a revelation that God wants to reform, change, that you need to understand. They all thought he was a heretic. But look at what the reform brought. So we're in the middle of a reformation, but look here. It says, and God will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will strike the land with a curse. And he said in verse 5, watch this. How is he going to do it? I will send the spirit or the anointing of Elijah. The prophet. So what kind of anointing is going to show up in the last days? An Elijah anointing that is not afraid to come against the false, the fake, the wrong, the evil. Elijah anointing absolutely confronts evil. John the Baptist, what did he come to do? His message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was a confronter. He was, he was not afraid. 
to speak out, to prepare the way of the Lord. Now, let's stop. Look at Matthew 16, verse 14. Is Jesus just the nice little uh, Galilean? Again, he wasn't nice in the sense of that, you know, he's so kind. He didn't speak up, didn't say anything, didn't hurt anybody's feelings, didn't ever call anything out, didn't ever confront the culture. No. Otherwise, they wouldn't have said this. So, go back up to uh, the earlier scriptures. Jesus' question, I think it's Matthew 16, is it 12? Go up to Matthew 16, 12. Okay, Jesus asks a question. And they understood, go to verse 13, there you go, sorry, we'll just keep going, we'll work together here. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, all right, hey man, you guys are out there on the streets. You know what the culture is saying about me. You know what the Jerusalem Chronicles are saying about me. So I want to ask you a question. Who do men say that I am? And notice the answers in verse 14. Why would they choose this Bible character if Jesus is so nice and conforming? conforming? They said, uh, some say you're John the Baptist. Whoa, 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 stop. Was John the Baptist a conformist? He was a nonconformist. John the Baptist was bold, rude, and he looked kind of ugly. They think that Jesus was John the Baptist. Why would they say that if he was just, oh, uh, tiptoe through the tulips with me today and, uh, and ignored sin, ignored the hypocrisy of the, of the evangelical community called the Pharisees, ignored what was going on with Herod and the Roman government. You know why Paul was beheaded? Oh, don't get involved in politics. Because Romans 1, have you ever read it where he talks against man with man, woman with woman? This is the Apostle Paul. And he went up to Rome which the Spirit of God says, by the way, Paul, if you go confront him over your message in the book of Romans, this is what's going to happen. And the prophet comes and puts a belt around the nonconformist Paul who was bold and confronted them over man versus man, man marrying man or man with man or lying with man, woman lying with woman. And he said, turning the truth and twisting it into a lie. Read Romans 1. He went up to Rome and, he, and that, that preacher, his pulpit was was. The prison cell, and if he, if he wasn't in prison, he sure as heck would have been behind a pulpit saying the same thing. So don't tell me you don't mix politics with preaching. Paul did, and guess what it did? It cost him his life. They beheaded him. And so Peter thinks, okay, well, hey, you know what? And guess who did it? Nero. Why was Nero so upset at the Apostle Paul and the Book of Romans? You know why? Because, because Nero was a homosexual. And he took a 12, they say, to 13-year-old boy and dressed him up in wedding garments and married him and declared that he was the queen. No wonder. Oh, Paul was just quiet. No, he lost his life. And yet we got people that walk out of churches. I don't want to hear anything political. You know why? Since the 60s, our nation is not recovered in some things like prayer in school, abortion. Because while they were bold, listen to me, African-Americans. Planned Parenthood. The whole thing was to wipe out the black population through the Democratic Party. And where was, where was the white Republicans? Where was the church? Where was the church? Let the bold preachers do it. But Jesus, notice what else they say. They say, hey man, some say, put it up. You're John the Baptist. He's a confronter. Now, look at, look at if he's just so nice. Others say you are Elijah. If Jesus was such a conformist and so nice, why would they compare him to two of the most controversial figures of boldness and confrontation in Scripture? Because you have religiousized your Jesus. Well, I don't believe that. Let me tell you why I believe it. Friday night at Joan Hunter's meeting, I was praying in the afternoon. I said, God, I just want you to show up. I just want you to, to do something because I sense you're going to have me say some bold things. As I was standing there, to my left, I saw a figure walk right by me. And as I could see its beard, his beard, excuse me, Lord, his beard. And I could see him go like this and he stood over here. And it startled me. And I said, hey, uh, I believe the Lord just walked in. And Kat Kerr was watching the whole thing. She jumps up and says, Jesus is standing there. 
Well, what do you do? So I got on my knees, and the whole, practically the whole con- uh, conference, they got on their knees. You could feel Jesus in the room. And I didn't know what to do because, you know, Jesus is standing there. He's in charge, not me. And I, so I said, Lord, we worship you. And Kat said to the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, is, is Hank supposed to stop? And the Holy Spirit said, no, Jesus came in to validate his words that he's been speaking but to stand next to him, that he is standing with him, for him, behind him, and he's validating his words. You you understand. And so, not everything I say has the Lord's validation, because he tells me afterwards sometimes. And we'll just leave that between God and I. But the the point is, the point is, what are we going to stand for? Now, why do we say that? Go to Mark chapter 10. In Mark chapter 10, I've been preaching to you about 2022 is going to be the year about you. Now, some of you, you want to say, well, it's never about us. Oh, excuse me. For God so loved the world, loved you that he gave his only begotten son. Yeah, it was about you. In fact, it was so much about you that before the foundations of the earth, before God ever came down and took that little muddy piece of clay uh, in a form of a human figure uh, called Adam, he was, he was a mud man. And, 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 and God himself would breathe into Adam, that clay uh, figure out of the earth's soil, before he would ever breathe breath or life into him, Jesus already determined, all right, well, once you breathe into him, he's going to sin. I will go and I will die. Oh, so it wasn't really about you? Now, ultimately, we know Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things will be added. You've got to have your priorities. God is always number one. But God is saying because of the harshness of what we have been through as a people that he is absolutely wanting to make this next year about us. He is wanting to bless you because of the harshness. That's exactly what he's saying. Now, there's some things that we've got to look at. And he gave me a scriptural example because I said, Lord, give me some out of the word that would let people know. And he gave me a question. Notice the question that Jesus, in verse 51, Jesus said to a man named Blind Bartimaeus, he said, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? Notice, if you want something from God, you better include the me, which is God. Better include the I. You better include him. Make him a part of your life. Make him the focus. Well, I want to be married. Well, make sure that your focus is, I want a godly husband. I want a godly wife. Okay, I'm not going to settle for anybody else. Right? I want to include you. God, I want your choice, not mine. So you have to understand that it's not just about, well, hey, you know, I want a new TV set. And, uh, you know, well, Lord, I want a new TV set so that I can watch Christian programming. And I won't use my TV set for evil. I want a new car. Well, Lord, you know what? I want a car where I can glorify you. And you don't have to put a Jesus glow-in-the-dark bumper sticker on it. I recommend the way most of us drive, let's not bring that kind of bad testimony to to the Lord. (laughs) Just keep your bumper sticker off. But you could say, Lord, I want a new car because I want to be able to show people that when you're a tither, when you're a giver, that, God, you bless. You bless in the middle of, of of a crazy economy. You know, and I'll tell people, Lord, if they say, man, nice car, I'll be like, hey, God gave this to me. When I'm getting gas, I'll be like, hey, the Lord gave this to me. Okay. (laughs) So you you include God. But but watch this. I want to read to you about blind Bartimaeus because there were some things that he did that is important for us as we come to the question that God is asking. What do you want me to do for you in 2022? I recognize y'all been through some stuff. How many have been through some stuff since 2020? 2021. Can I get... Okay, huh? Yeah, see your hands? But look here. Let's read the story. Verse 46. They came to Jericho, and later, as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples, notice what kind of crowd. It was a large crowd. A beggar who was named Blind Bartimaeus. Now, if you read this story in Matthew 20, you'll see that there were two beggars, two blind men, but Mark only mentions one. You'll also see in Matthew 20 that the story lists out that the uh, mother of James and John comes and asks Jesus for her sons to sit at the right hand. You know, it's kind of like this. It's not that it's a contradiction. It's just, you know, uh, Mark is leaving out some details that Matthew decided to include in his, uh, his story. Okay, it's kind of like if you ask Brenda, if Brenda and I both go to the store and you ask her, so uh, where'd you go? She'll say, I went to the store. You ask me, oh man, the clouds were beautiful and, and, and in the sunny sky and I went to the store and when I walked in the store, I'll give you details. Brenda, just as a matter of fact, went to the store. Well, which one? That one. Not me, man. I went to the store named this, and, you know, when I was walking in, I could watch a person that had a demon, and, and, you know, that's just me. That's the way it is sometimes when you're looking at the Gospels. 
But notice there was a blind man named Bartimaeus. Now, this was a blind man, but you know what? You don't have to stay blind. He was a blind man. Now, let me tell you why I'm saying this to you. There are people, you know, they quote Matthew 24 many times, and they, and they quote about, you know, these are end-time scriptures. There will be wars, rumors of wars, uh, earthquakes in various places. And, but they don't realize that Jesus said three times, let no man deceive you. So there's this deception that I have seen come on this culture. It's why we need an Elijah-type anointing, because it's a confrontive anointing against what's trying to deceive the people or blind the people. So it's for your benefit that God releases that kind of anointing. And so what happens is blindness of ignorance has come among many people. He lit up, you know, but the one with the mask was like, and my heart broke. Because, again, that's her choice. But I'm like, lady, are are you resolved? Why, Why someone told you? Why are you basing it on someone told you? You know, that's exactly what God said when Adam and Eve ate of the tree. They were talking to a snake. And God said, who told you you were naked? Because they've been talking to the wrong thing. So you've got to make sure the source of whatever's telling you not to get the jab, if they're telling you, is correct. If they're telling you to get the jab, make sure that the source is speaking correctly and it's not an evil plot or plan. The next one comes up and she says, well, what are you here for? Bless them. You know, that we're never going to take America with them anyway. Okay, I, I want a bloodless revolution. But you're never going to get it with people who can't even listen to the rest and, and reason in truth. I never said that they shouldn't get it. Why are they walking out? Well, they have to go to the bathroom. All right, well, bless them then. But here's the thing. It's so amazing how touchy we are. And yet, here's what is scary to me. We are literally, the issue is, I guess they told me. Don't you ever consider your own rights? Don't you ever consider, is my freedom and my constitutional right being affected here? And why are you mandating something so much for me and pushing it so hard when it hasn't been proven? And people are getting the very thing you're supposed to be protecting them from. And I don't have a right to resolve And take my time to figure it out, pray about it? No, you want to fire me. We have become blinded, and they want us to be blinded. That's why they went after the church and shut down the churches, because we are nice, compliant people. All these rules. Where where, where are you getting your rules? They knew we were compliant, but what they're trying to see is how much they can get by with to see what they can impose next. And the scary thing is, When you trade your safety for your freedom, you are talking about Nazi Germany. That's exactly what Hitler did. And he marched them off to concentration camps. They thought they were being safe. And he gassed them. Our officers, our military, thank God that it's not about their safety over your freedom or their own. Or we wouldn't have a country today. That's why as a preacher, I'm not here to try to preach safe little things. Now, not every time we assemble are you going to hear a message like this. There there is a balance. But can I tell you something? What do you do when we've been so out of balance that you think I'm out of balance? We have been so far the other direction since 1960, since abortion and prayer out of school. We we have churches that are so user-friendly they won't say anything because they don't want to offend you and they need your money. They want to build their big buildings. And so we think that I'm out of balance or others when really we're trying to steer this ship into the right direction. So he was blind. Yeah. Let's preach a couple more minutes here. But notice he said, thou son, uh, he cried out. Notice he began to cry out and say. Notice when the confrontation of and the anointing of Elijah came, the people were silent. But blind Bartimaeus realized, wait a minute. I don't want to be blind. And if you don't want to be blinded by mandates and by things that are trying to take your freedoms, don't be quiet. Speak up. Get involved with your school system. Get involved with your government. Call their numbers, senators, when laws are going on the books that you don't like or you don't agree with. 
And so they kept, he, he cried out, but notice what his cry was. It wasn't complaining. Some people are today, oh, I don't like how things are. I don't like how this nation is going. Well, his cry wasn't a cry of complaint. His cry was a focus upon the one and the thing that could help him. Notice his cry. Jesus, thou son of David. Why did he say son of David? Because those are covenant terms. He was saying, Jesus, thou son of David. Jesus, covenant God. I'm crying out, watch this, for your mercy. Do you know that if we would cry out to God for his mercy? Come on, we're getting ready to celebrate Thanksgiving. Do you know in 1607 when they came across and went to Cape Henry and, the, and they got out of the boat and they took the wooden cross and they put it upon the very sandy soil of Cape Henry? Can you imagine when they put it down on the hole, the reverberation that was heard throughout the world? In hell, especially. Can you imagine what the angels were doing? They were, they were gathering as they knelt there and they prayed and they dedicated this land to God and they covenanted this land with God. And even furthermore, listen, oh, there should be separation between church and state. That's not what the documents say. It was never implied for the, for the church to not speak regarding the state. It was to protect the church from the state coming in and mandating and legislating things that would take away our voice. In fact, if politics were not supposed to be part of the church, then why did many of the ministers sign the Declaration of Independence? Aren't they supposed to be independent of it? They're a preacher. And why, when they would open up their, co their, their sessions in Congress, they would literally say, Lord, give us a preacher. They would invite a preacher to come in and say, this is the way that our future of our nation should be, is we want to open up every session with a man of God leading prayer. There was a cry, Lord have mercy. And many, watch what the response was. If you start crying out right now and let your voice be heard, you're going to be censored. You're going to be told to shut up. Notice what it says. It says, they sternly told him, shut up, be quiet. Mark chapter 10 out of the Amplified Version, you know what it says? They severely censored them and reproved them. Come on, how many of you have been censored? You've been in Facebook jail. You've been knocked off of social media. Form of censoring. Why? Because you're crying out. If you're just a complier and a conformist, they aren't going to mess with you. They did the same thing to blind Bartimaeus. Now watch this. You know what it means to be stern? They were stern with his crying out of independence and freedom that affected his life. And sternness means this. Listen, this is exactly what some are experiencing, especially those that are being threatened over their job. Sternness is a person who is serious and unrelenting, especially... In the assertion of authority and exercise of discipline. The word stern means to be strict, to be severe, and they use extreme measures. Are you seeing that? You're going to be fired. We're mandating. What's a mandate? Man's involvement and setting a time frame, a date. Strict is also putting someone or something under extreme pressure. You got till the 15th. Yet what was... Blind Bartimaeus' response. Look here. They sternly told him to be quiet in verse 48, but he kept crying out all the more. Now watch this. Verse 49, what did Jesus do? Did Jesus think he was a cultic uh, uh, weirdo? No. Jesus stopped. It got his attention. It's getting the Lord's attention when we are standing up for him and for this nation, for his church. And he called him over here. Notice he called him over here. Why did he call him over here? He was trying to establish, and it's why things in some people's minds have taken so long. I'm almost done. Is because God is doing an on-purpose separation. He called him over here. In other words, come over here. There was a separation from there to here. And Moses had to do the same thing in the book of Exodus. God told him, Moses, gather the people and say, who is on the Lord's side? We are being tested right now, like in Judges chapter 7. How many of you remember the story of Gideon? There was a, 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 an army that was as numerous as the sand on the seashore on the horizon. They knew they were outnumbered. And yet God said a ridiculous thing. He said, get me, get me soldiers. And there was 32,000 that showed up for the battle. But all of a sudden, once they saw the enemy, they didn't care about their nation anymore. They, with fear, 22,000 of them out of the 32,000 because of fear, did not stand for their nation, did not stand for their families, did not stand for their God, and they represent some today that rode off in fear. Oh, we just don't want to speak up. We don't want to do anything. Let it be somebody else's problem. Let the other soldiers take care of it. And they rode off and left the battle for the nation, 
for God and for the people to somebody else. That's why there's preachers today you still haven't opened your churches. That's why preachers, you won't even talk about things behind your pulpit. You're part of the 22,000 that's rode off. And, and, and you, don't, you, you don't empower your people. And yet they're getting beat up every week by the culture, by their jobs. 10,000 remained. But out of that 10,000, 9,700. They weren't afraid. Here's the problem. Some people aren't afraid today. Here's the problem. God said, all right, separate them at the water. And whoever brings the water up to their mouth and laps like a dog, those are the ones I'm going to choose. Out of 10,000, only 300 fit the bill of separation. Because the 9,700 are doing exactly what a lot of evangelicals are doing. Yeah, you're not afraid. Oh, I'll speak up for my nation. Yeah, but you got, you got, you're distracted. They stuck their face in the water and they began to lap up the blessings. And a lot of people, that's all church experience is. is oh, I just want to come for me. I have a problem. I have a need. I need healing. Well, that's, that's legitimate stuff. But you got to be like the 300 who recognize, yeah, you have a personal need. They still drink of the same water. The difference is they didn't take their eyes off of the enemy who was trying to attack and destroy their nation. And that's why they went like this. Hey, I have needs. Hey, I'm going to church. But, man, I want to be part of the fight. And they were chosen. So let's go on. We're almost done. Can they come to the piano? Now, notice what they told him. They didn't say coward. They said, blind Barnabas, take courage. Stand up. The Lord is calling. And notice what he did. He threw off, blind Bartimaeus threw off his garment. Now, do you know that that was a beggar garment that identified you as unclean? It identified you as a beggar unclean. Do you know that was not imposed by God? It was imposed by the authorities. It was in, These guys have things to do. That's why they're walking out. Because they want me to get done. But, but here's the thing. Listen, can I just have just a couple minutes, please? Because I wasn't here last week, and I want to I wanna just do this. This garment, we liken it to him as a garment that identified him as unclean, identified him as, hey, if you get around him, you know, this guy's blind, he's got a problem. Okay, today they're putting masks over people's faces. That's not imposed by God, it's being imposed upon us by authorities, by the culture. But notice a man who wanted to see said, man, i got to get this mask off of me. Be resolved. If you want to keep wearing it, that's fine. This man was resolved that that cloak was doing nothing for him except falling into the hands of the authorities and the people that kept trying to divide him, ostracize him, shut him up, and make him feel like he wasn't good enough or he was doing something wrong because he didn't take the jab or he stood up at his job because of his religious convictions or his constitutional convictions. But he threw it off. And Jesus said, hey, what do you want me to do for you, stand to your feet. So you say, well, Pastor Hank, what, 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 why, why do you think the Lord is saying this? I'm sharing all of this about what I'm sharing because God wants the question to drive home. He realizes that they've been stern with you. He realizes that they're imposing things upon you. He realizes that they've put uh, an unauthorized cloak upon you. Right? Hitler comes along and he does the same thing. Hey, let's depopulize everything and let's do it by uh, an extreme race that we're going to create. Then Planned Parenthood comes along. The 60s uses the Democratic Party, legalizes abortion. To, it breaks my heart when I look out and I see some of our black brothers and sisters. They wanted you to be exterminated. How dare they? They shut down our churches. Why? They want to exterminate the church. But the gates of hell will never prevail against us. So why are they pushing so many things from something that originated in China that they're mandating and pushing for it and making us think that we just have to go along with it and not question it? My, my, my question or my problem is not the choice. My problem is the lack of resolve. They want to do it, that's up to them. But why? And what's your resolve? What conclusion have you reached? And so God wants it to be about you this year because of the harshness that you've been under. And don't say, well, God doesn't.